In this lecture, we're going to be discussing bacterial cell walls. Um, we're going to list off several functions of bacterial cell walls and what they do for the bacteria. And then we're going to talk about the molecular structure of peptidoglycan, which is the main component of cell walls of bacteria. And we're going to talk about how that peptidoglycan gets made or synthesized. And so we have been talking about um, the inside structures of bacteria, the nucleoid regions, what's going on in the cytoplasm with ribosomes, um, and then we made our way out to the plasma membrane, and bacterial cells have additional layers external to the plasma membrane called the cell wall and the capsule. And we generally refer to all of these outer structures, the plasma membrane, the cell wall, and the capsule as the cell envelope. And so we're going to be focusing specifically on the structure of the cell walls today, which are external to the plasma membrane or more on the outside. And so there are some important functions of a bacterial cell wall. And the major one is to help maintain the shape and the integrity of that bacteria structure. But cell walls can also do some other things. They can help prevent loss of water from the bacterial cells and prevent those swells from either shrinking or bursting in the environment. They can protect bacteria from certain toxic substances and they can contribute to making bacteria more pathogenic or harmful to humans. And so the cell wall is mainly made of this molecule called peptidoglycan. And peptidoglycan sort of tells you what components are in it in its name. Peptido means there's a little bit of protein or peptide, and glycan means there's some sugar or carbohydrates. And so peptidoglycan is a really big molecule, and it's made up of many <coughs> repeating subunits. And those subunits are strung together to make this peptidoglycan in the cell wall. Each one of these repeating subunits has two sugars, NAG and NAM, and you can see those over here in the picture on the right. NAG is in orange, NAM in yellow. And then in addition to the two sugars, the subunit will have a short peptide or short string of amino acids, usually four or five. So this whole image on the right is one peptidoglycan subunit or piece. It's got the two sugars, NAG and NAM, and it's got this short peptide. And peptidoglycan, if we were to kind of zoom out and look at the big picture, creates this strong mesh structure, which you can see here in the image, called a sacculus. And the way that these subunits of peptidoglycan are strung together to make the sacculus is something that looks like this. Here's one peptidoglycan subunit right here in the front. It's got two sugars and the small peptide chain, and that is linked to another peptidoglycan subunit. Two sugars, peptide chain, which is linked to another subunit and another. And these subunits are linked together and bonded in a helix shape or a helical strand like you can see here, where all of the sugars are making up the core part of the helix and those peptide chains are kind of sticking out from all the sides. And those peptide chains are important, and it's important that they stick out from the sides because they allow two helixes or two helices of peptidoglycan subunits to stick together. So here, this picture looks a little different, but it's showing the same thing, a peptidoglycan strand. Here's the NAG and NAM subunits. Here's those peptides hanging off. So you can see that long chain of sugars in purple and blue, and those peptides hanging out. And you can see on this next strand down, some peptides hanging up. And there are actually bonds that can form between the peptides in different peptidoglycan helices that connects this top strand to the center strand right here, connects the center strand to the third strand here and here, 
and you can see what those bonds would look like in a more molecular form here on the left. And so in order for peptidoglycan to be made, for those subunits to be added to a chain to grow the cell wall, there are a couple of steps that have to happen. And so NAG and NAM need to be sort of primed in order to be put together into a subunit to make peptidoglycan. So NAG, the sugar, has to have another molecule added to it called UDP. And that means it's sort of like primed and ready to go for synthesis. And the same thing happens with NAM and the small peptide. It also has to be primed and made ready to go by adding this molecule called UDP. So now we have NAG, we have NAM, and we have the peptide, and they're all primed and ready to be put together to make peptidoglycan. All right, so how is this happening? How are we gonna build this structure, the cell wall on the outside? This image here, I'm gonna break down step by step. So first, we have our primed NAM pentapeptide here in pink, and it gets added to a special molecule, which you can see here in white, called bactoprenol in the cytoplasm of the bacteria. Bactoprenol acts like a shuttle molecule that's able to take the growing, um, the subunits of peptidoglycan from the inside of the bacterial cell to the outside. So this first step is getting bactoprenol, this shuttle connected to NAM pentapeptide. And in the process, you form this thing called lipid one. You can see bactoprenol here. You can see the NAM pentapeptide here, and now they're all connected. And this whole complex is lipid one. So you've got NAM pentapeptide, but now you need to add the NAG to it because every peptidoglycan subunit needs both sugars as well as the peptide. And so in the next step here, lipid one becomes lipid two. And the way that this happens is by NAG being added to the structure over here. So NAM, peptide, and back to prenol in lipid one. And now NAG is being added to this molecule, which is still attached to bactoprenol, and it becomes lipid two. And so now you've got your peptidoglycan subunit, NAG, NAM, and peptide, attached to your shuttle, bactoprenol, which is perfect. You've got your subunit that you're gonna add to growing cell wall, growing pe peptidoglycan, and it's attached to your shuttle. But now that shuttle needs to move from the inside of the cell to the outside where the cell wall is. And so in the next step, bactoprenol basically flips this subunit from the inside of the bacterial cell to the outside. And so now you can see the, sub, the peptidoglycan subunit is no longer in. It's actually hanging out to where the cell wall would be. And now that bactoprenol did its job and it brought the subunit outside to where the cell wall is, you don't need bactoprenol anymore. It's going to drop off the subunit to a growing peptidoglycan chain on the outside. Bactoprenol basically allows this subunit to be released and it can be added to the peptidoglycan wall. But what you notice is that, yes, that's great. We took a subunit, we added it to the cell wall. That's beautiful. But we still have bactoprenol out here on the outside. And if we want it to work as a shuttle, now it's stuck on the outside, which means it's not in here bringing new pieces out. So we need a way to get bactoprenol to move from the outside back to the inside or the cytoplasm. <coughs> And you can see that process happening here. And if you look at this molecule on the bottom, bactoprenol with two phosphates, and then this one on the top, you've got bactoprenol with one phosphate or one P. So in order for bactoprenol to move from the outside to the inside, it has to lose one phosphate group 
or be dephosphorylated. So bactoprenol is dephosphorylated, and now it can serve as a shuttle again for the next peptidoglycan subunit. And so as I said, this shuttle just needs to lose a phosphate in order to do that. And so the last step of peptidoglycan synthesis is the formation of those bonds between the peptide crosslinks or the chains, right? And so we talked about how peptidoglycan has these peptide chains kind of hanging out from the outside of helix. And here you can see NAG and NAM and that peptide chain on one strand of the peptidoglycan cell wall and another NAG and NAM and a peptide chain on the strand below it. And so in order for the strands to be held together, to give the cell wall some strength and some integrity, you don't wanna just have strands piled on top of each other. You wanna be able to connect them and build some bridges to build a strong wall. And so you can see here, this is the process of transpeptidation, which means that there's a bond formed between the peptide chain on one strand of peptidoglycan and the peptide chain on the other. And like I said, that helps build the integrity of the cell wall and keep it strong. So you need to be able to extend the helix by adding NAGNAM subunits to it. And you also need to be able to connect the helices to each other with these peptide bonds. And so there are some great animations, which is really helpful when visualizing the peptidoglycan synthesis. And so what I'd like you guys to do is to go to these two links and to check out how peptidoglycan synthesis works with an animation, because it's sometimes easier to see it in 3D. And then this actually on the bottom will show you how penicillin, which is an antibiotic that is relatively common, works to affect cell wall synthesis. And peptidoglycan um, synthesis is important for bacteria to survive, right? Because they need that cell wall. Penicillin actually stops peptidoglycan synthesis. And that's how it works as an antibiotic to kill bacteria. But I want you to check these animations out and use them as a way to visualize this process because I know it can be a little difficult in 2D. And so in the next lecture, we'll talk a little bit about um, the two different types of cell walls, gram-positive and gram-negative.